Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Prince Virus Decode, where we answer all your questions about COVID with the help of experts. Today, we will be talking about drugs that are used today to treat COVID. Two new ones have been recommended by WHO. Those are Sotrovimab and Baricitinib. To get us answers, we have with us two experts, Dr. Virendra Chauhan. He is the former chairman of UGC and he's the former director of the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. He is also known for his work on the recombinant malaria vaccine. Also with us is Dr. M.K. Ganguly, who is the former ICMR director. He specializes in tropical and cardiovascular diseases and immunology. A warm welcome to both of our guests. Dr. Chauhan, may we start with you? Now, we have heard of monoclonal antibodies before and antibody cocktails as well. Can you walk us through how they work and how so Trovimab works? So all <clears throat> monoclonal antibodies uh, to a disease like the present one, monoclonal antibodies are used for many disease conditions. <clears throat> they, especially for cancer, they are very useful for cancer. So principle, I'll try to make it as less technical as possible for the viewer. So when you uh, immunize or when you vaccinate or when you see a foreign uh, material in the form of a pathogen or a protein, the body immediately responds to it and makes antibodies, which is one arm of the immune immunity and also activate T cells, but we will not talk about T cells just now, just the B cells that make antibodies. Antibodies are like soldiers. They will remember, and the next time when you have the pathogen again or the protein again, and these, these fellows, these soldiers are very capable of recognizing and utilizing. All antibodies are not utilizing antibodies, but subset of them are utilizing. And as you see in the press or report or the newspaper, neutralizing antibodies are the ones which, as the name suggests, will get hold of the virus or any pathogen or, or for that matter, any protein or which is expressed, uh, which you want to neutralize. In the, so what is monoclonal then? So the response to a given protein, a protein is shaped like by fist, you will get responses around the whole structure. So the immune system will see the whole structure and you'll get, we call them epitoles, but each region will produce a lot of antibodies. So you get a large number of antibodies, very large. These are called the polyclonal response. So you get very large number of antibodies. But if you have a determinant, which is let's say uh, this portion, and you think that is the neutralizing part of the protein or of the pathogen, then you find ways to make antibodies only to this. So these are then antibodies that are taken out, then produce a large scale. Now recombinant technology can be used to produce many, many million copies of an antibody with neutralizing antibodies. And there's a technique how to make monoclonal from uh, once you've identified them. And this, so what you've been hearing, so you would have in principle monoclonal antibody therapy for any disease, as long as what you want to do is to neutralize the pathogen coming. So earlier on, so you would have not one monoclonal. In fact, many people can isolate many monoclonal, in fact, thousands of monoclonals. Then you find which of the monoclonal antibodies are efficacious. So you would have large number of monoclonal, but all of them may not have that efficacy. So what you are now beginning to see in the market, where the various name cocktail simply means instead of just having one antibody, you have two or three. So, so antibodies have that much role. Antibodies and monoclonal will not stop you from getting infection. These are curatives in that sense. So you have infection and you're getting onto, or you have cancer and then you want to treat it. So these are, this is how the monoclonal work. The other two drugs that you have earlier seen, one from Merck, one from Pfizer, and another one uh, is in the pipeline. These are small molecules. These are 
chemical, uh, small chem chemical structures. All these have been repurposed. So they have been, they have been developed many, many years back. Pharma company have hundreds and thousands of them and they screened all of them. So three of them, one is the Merck one, one is Pfizer one, right now seems to look better. Merck one, ICMR has simply said that there are more risks than the benefits. So these are additional tools that are getting in our toolbox to deal with the current virus in addition to very successful vaccination program. I hope I partly answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. And in that vein, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ganguly. Um, so baricitinib is described as a Janus kinase inhibitor, and that suppresses the overstimulation of the immune system. So it has also been used in rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition. So can you tell us a little bit about how this drug works? Yeah, actually, uh, Sotorimab, I want to say something about that also. Yes, please. That uh, it was found that it's a monoclonal antibody by GSK. It has uh, Regener Regeneron and Elilali monoclonal antibodies, cocktail antibodies, were not working against Omicron. It was tested, they were not working against Omicron. But somehow the, the GSK got lucky that Sotorimab works against Omicron. And uh, this was just a pure luck. Normally, a cocktail should be used because if you use one, you can cause mutations. But Sotorimab does, does that. Baricitinib, India has completed trials and uh, the controller office has gone through this. One of the things which happens during uh, COVID infections, particularly the Delta variant and other, is uh, the large surge of immune responses which attack your body. These are the these are called autoimmune responses, and they choose almost every organ in the body and damage those. The kidney disease, uh, kin, kidney is one of the uh, organs. Liver is another organ. Heart is one of the organs. Lungs, of course, everyone knows, is one of the target organs. But the brain also is one of the organs, and these uh, immune responses. They, in certain percentage of persons, they actually cause damage. And these damage could be measured before through the biomarkers. At the moment, the biomarker repertoire is not too many which are which were being used. Uh, but uh, now the proteomic and other studies have appeared in very reputed journal like Cell and other uh, publications. And we have a series of uh, biomarkers which could be studied in these subjects to identify who could be more prone to the damage. And substances like baricitinib and others perhaps will benefit them. So many of the immunosuppressants which are used, which have been used, that those have been used to really quell the immune responses, which could damage your own self because of the COVID-19 infection. Baricitinib is one of them. Tocilizumab, et cetera, several other anti-inflammatory substances have also been used in these substances. They also cause some harm. Uh, Baricitinib doesn't do that, but others can cause the reactivation of the um, infections which are latent. And these latent infections are worrying. There are tuberculosis, pneumocystis, carinii, so, so many of other fungal infections, etc. So, uh, so instead of steroid, which is one of the best immunosuppressants and for others, but could cause damage, tremendous damage, some of these have been used. These monoclonal antibodies or, or these substances which have been used for this are awfully expensive. And they have to be, they are expensive because they have to be used in 
50 milligram or 100 milligram doses. So you have to have very efficient fermentation system to produce produce these. So these are these are the challenges. But as Dr. Chauhan was saying, the two new antivirals which have been now available, they have given a lot of hope. The molupiravir actually within two days reduces the virus 90% if given early. Few of the studies which were available in the animals as um, which could cause teratogenic or, or they could cause problems in pregnant women are present in many, many other drugs. One of the drugs I, I myself was part of the discovery and putting in India was an anti leishmanial drug which uh, was which could be given orally so, so this was also found to be the same so what you do that in pregnant women or uh, you don't give it and if they are uh, childbearing age and you are giving it you do a pregnancy test and then give it and then advise them that you don't do, um, they do the family planning but the and it is so easily synthesized and India com companies are six companies are synthesizing it then the Paxilovid which is which is the which is a Pfizer drug which is very complex six step synthesis drug very complex drug or it is what it it up to 80 percent 90 percent of that viruses it could destroy if given early it is better than monopinar piravir and this also got sanctioned now okay. and this one uh, so, pfizer is also had called for um, applications from the developing world that those who want to do that and the last date was january 6 so probably by March, this should be available in the global market also. At the moment, limited quantities are available in the United States. <laughs> so there will be a repertoire of drugs, which, which will be <clears throat> new monoclonal antibodies, which will be developed against Omicron and new variants. There will be the existing one, which has been tested better. And there will be new antivirals which will get perhaps emergency authorization because an, an, an NCI takes around three to five years minimum if you are very, very uh, quick to materialize and get into the market. But now the total regulatory system around the world is changing and maybe we will have more things to do uh, to combat this virus in the future. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly. Um, with that, I want to pass on to Abantika. Uh, you know, in your reporting, you do talk to doctors and then, of course, uh, you also do some pharma reporting. So in your experience, what has it been like whenever new drugs have been approved? How quick is the uptake? Do doctors receive the drugs immediately? Um, I mean, in terms of usage and immediately start prescribing its use or does it typically take some time? So uh, the time is in the availability. Once the availability happens, then something interesting, we saw something very interesting in the last wave, especially in, during the second wave uh, with Remdesivir. Uh, when it came to a point when doctors started saying that we are prescribing it under pressure because the family is distraught, they want us to, uh, you know, uh, prescribed. You remember there was a time when there was a shortage of remdesivir and it came to a point when, uh, you know, doctors were of the opinion that maybe this patient does not need the medicine, but families started getting so hyper, they had to use it. Um, the same thing happened. At, that was not a new drug, but it had severe consequences. Same thing happened with steroids, the overuse. Um, in fact, that is partly why today, the new clinical treatment guide, I mean, the clinical treatment guidelines for COVID that have been released by the ministry this today, this morning, uh, there 
you know, there are not much changes since last time, but it has been spelt out very clearly that overuse of steroids can uh, sort of predispose patients to mycomycosis. Uh, please do not, uh, you know, use it unless warranted and those, uh, situ those uh, particular circumstances are given. So I think, uh, especially in COVID, where there is so much focus and all of us, you know, uh, we report upcoming drugs with a lot of uh, sort of regularity, much, much more than, say, any other disease we have ever done, probably. Now, what happens is whenever a new drug comes and because people are desperate to get uh, like a magic cure, we, we like to talk in absolutes and unfortunately, science doesn't allow that. But, um, you know, there is this, every time a new, for the latest I think is monopiravir when, you know, the jury is still out on how safe or not safe it is, but people still want it to be used because they think that's the new magic cure. So yeah, if, if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, Dr. Ganguly is having a bit of a connection issue. Can I just um, add? Yes, please, Dr. Chahan. Can I just add to what Ganguly is saying about these drugs? So, uh, the, when the, both the drugs were being approved by FDA in the process, many countries, including some in Southeast Asia, had already placed orders, even when they were yet not FDA approved. The Merck drug was first approved in the UK. And Merck, by own admission, initially said this is a 50% efficacy. And within three weeks, they came up and said the efficacy actually is lesser than what they observed earlier. So the, the point that the patients or the family press you, when this is the human tendency, when you see there is nothing working, it's a small ray of hope somewhere you rushed. So adoption of these drugs will not be a problem, but people need to understand these drugs cannot be, they will not be effective halfway through the infection. They have to be given in the beginning. If the viral load has become high, then the drugs will, and they're taking, you have to take a lot of pills. These are five days courses running into 40 pills. So, and they have to be consumed uh, uh, very earlier on. And so there's a catch. So your infection has to be detected earlier on. So your detection system has to be very good. So in, your, in a country where they'll be taken up or countries they'll be taken up, your, your ability to detect the virus earlier on has to be, it will be problem in poor countries. It will be problem in Africa. Most of these drugs produced by Pfizer and Merck have already been ordered in millions of doses. So availability will be problem. The final thing about these two and, and hope for the subsequent drugs, which are repurposed drugs, that these companies are signing license contracts with the country, especially India it becomes very important, with a generic company upfront. As the drugs are being developed, these license uh, uh, licensure has been uh, worked out. So therefore, larger amount of these drugs will be available. So availability, cost will be still a problem. In, 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 in the $700 is what we hear earlier. So it will be expensive, but it'll be there. And when a country like India and Israel and, 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 and Korea, they start producing in vast amount, then of course the cost will come down. So good thing is about these generic the drugs, they will be produced by generic manufacturer and availability, at least in the market, will not be a very big issue. Thank you. Um, welcome back, Dr. Ganguly. Uh, and, and I'm actually going to start uh, taking some of our viewer questions as well right now. Um, so first, Anita asks, and I think uh, Dr. Ganguly, you could answer this. How does ICMR arrive at treatment guidelines? Is it mandatory for doctors in India to follow the guidelines? Actually, uh, uh, the uh, doctors are the kings, you know. If uh, if the drug controller of General of India have uh, approved a drug for a particular level claim, the doctors could use it, but they could heed ICMR guideline if they wish, and and uh, they could also use it off level, 
Like I will give you one example. Like ceratinophyll citrate was used for an erectile dysfunction. Some, but people knew that it works against nitric oxide uh, synthetase. So in the blue baby syndrome, to save the babies, some of the doctors used it off level. And now it has become a practice to use it in blue babies. The same way for pulmonary hypertension, there was no treatment available. So, but the one of the discoveries which happened in pulmonary hypertension and the high altitude was it is also uh, if you deal with the nitric oxide issue, you could deal with the pulmonary hypertension. So, doctors started using off level this, uh, those drugs and thereby they started actually uh, using it in pulmonary hypertension now, both, both as a drug as well as a gene therapy. So doctors make a decision about the patient. If they have sufficient proof of concept, if they have been used around the globe and there are good data about its safety and there is a good data about its efficacy, which they think uh, will benefit the patient, and if the Drug Control General of India has approved that drug, they can use that drug. But guidelines are normally made by analyzing a lot of data which is coming up from the different trials. And, and these guidelines are updated from time to time because they are not patthar ki lakir, as we call it. As we have seen so many things in... Uh, in the COVID had fallen down the line, whether it was a chloroquine, whether it was ivermectin, colchicine, you just name it. There is a huge graveyard of the substances which has come as a guideline and have gone. But doctors use their experience also. So that is how the things are gone. I have myself chaired the INC um, the committee for about 18 years. Now, even when I was out of ICMR, I had chaired for a certain number of years. And we weigh a lot of data sets before it is approved, approved of India. And many times now, in case of the case of this uh, disease, uh, we are taking sometimes a WHO pre-qualification as well as the US FDA or Canada Health or Australian FDA and EMA, if they have gone the approval over there, so for a quick uh, availability of those drugs, if we don't, we sometimes the Indian regulator approves them early under emergency authorization while you get a man of data for ultimately using, using those. So these are some of the things which actually, but few things, uh, if a drug is being approved, ethically, there are few things which are important. Firstly, that it should be available in the country. If it is not available in the country, then it causes very big uh, problem. There was a drug known as beta seron, which at that at one time was used for multiple sclerosis. But in those days, the technology was not that advanced. It, it could be produced enough for the United States patients only. So India didn't allow this to be uh, approved in India through trials because it was simply, it will not be available. So those who participate in the trial, they will, they will actually waste their uh, the, the effort as well as it will be taking ethically taking advantage of the population. One of the questions which you asked earlier, I will like to deal with this, that always it used to come as a major uh, dampener that some of the drugs which were discovered, they were too costly for the other, or, other countries. So there was a committee which was formed in WHO to take uh, to create thinking that you can 
have those patented entities in the developed world. I, just, I said that. Gavli Sahib, I explained that already. Okay. So I'm okay. just giving one, my last thought in this, that because I was part of that committee and uh, what we actually looked at that time, that there are three or four mechanisms which we actually advocated. One, pay, by patenting for the pool, pool, creating a patenting pool and allowing this to be done in other places. And one thing happened, which actually caused this uproar much more, that there was H5N1 infection and Indonesia sent its train to Australia and they made a, a vaccine out of it and they sold it, they tried to sell it in Indonesia at $28 a dose. In $1, you can buy seven or eight chicken in Indonesia. So $28 was something which created uproar. So after that, this open licensing system came up. And one of the best example was hepatitis C drug, which is now available. And even Egypt made it still better. It sold in around... 300 uh, rupees, the entire doses of the hepatitis C. So the pricing, as Dr. Chauhan has explained, it uh, the same happened in the hepatitis B vaccine. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gangli, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, we've been, uh, despite all of this, even now with COVID, we're still facing vaccine inequity. And uh, like Dr. Chauhan mentioned, even drug inequity at this point. Uh, and a lot of the times, in fact, there are even drugs that are proven to not work, which are getting sold out. I just want to go to Abantika for a second. Um, Abantika, have you, you know, we still, uh, whenever people get diagnosed and go to say their family physicians or something, and you look at the prescription, people are getting uh, things like azithromycin, vitamin C, zinc, and, you know, like medicines, which we know are not going to work or are just not going to be helpful at all. Um, so can you name a uh, few of these drugs that you think uh, that you can notice that are still being prescribed indiscriminately, something like uh, ivermectin, are those kind of drugs still in the picture? Actually, azithromycin, uh, one of our own colleagues tested positive. She sent me her prescription. Actually, three people in the family were positive. All three had az azithromycin in that uh, list. Um, also vitamin C, zinc, everything was there. Uh, so I think uh, a, a lot of the medicines that we started off using and uh, those that were not uh, sort of expressly uh, instructions were that please don't use them. A lot of those continue to be used. Um, uh, I, I, I've met hydroxychloroquine is, is an interesting uh, exception, I think, because uh, at one point of time, I think every doctor in the country was having it. Uh, that has stopped now, thankfully, uh, nobody is having that. But I believe a lot of doctors are still having vitamin C zinc uh, themselves for uh, protective uh, reasons. Uh, so I think of, on COVID, there's, there's so much that is, it's, it's such a dynamic situation, so much is happening, so much is coming in, so much is going out. Uh, by the time you have sort of acclimatized to the new uh, rules, uh, you know, a new wave is there. So then you go back to what you think worked last time. So I think that's a kind of inevitable uh, in a sense. Yeah, but hopefully with these guidelines, the guidelines now are much clearer and I, the WHO's graphic is also really good and it tells you exactly when to use right. which drug. Yeah, so hopefully it might be it might be a bit more positive now. Um, Dr. Chauhan, speaking about antibiotics, I just wanted to quickly ask you, given the indiscriminate prescription of azithromycin and doxycycline, uh, what is there a real risk of uh, contributing to antibiotic resistance? Oh, absolutely. And uh, you've said it very mildly. There's obviously, these drugs, we are very good at making these drugs ineffective uh, very fast, and especially when you don't need them. And you know, the, 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 this is a very layered situation. There's so much misinformation on the 
on the social media, on the internet. There's so much information you can obtain yourself. People have gone hoarse. I have, we have said so much about what doesn't work, but that hasn't stopped. So I'm really surprised sometimes, sometimes some of the GP's uh, insistence of not reading what WHO is saying or what ICMR is saying. I'm just amazed. Uh, so this misbehavior, in fact, to be, you know, the, the one part of your question is this, not only the successful uh, uh, antibiotics, the future antibiotics, people don't want to even discover new antibiotics because countries like India, Indonesia, the, the Southeast Asia, they fear the moment they introduce them, in no time they will be misused and there will be, so uh, there will be resistance. And bacteria are, bacteria are very, very efficient in, in getting infected. So overuse of antibacterial should be really, really it's, it's going to be a serious problem. It's already a serious problem. In fact, if COVID disappears tomorrow, we are back to going to the most important health problem would be antibiotic resistance. And COVID situation, the, misbe the bad behavior right now is only going to add to the situation. <coughs> So this is going to be a serious, serious issue. And doctors, I don't know how to give this message. You can say the public have this response. You have no idea what to do. You can't access a doctor. You walk over to a chemist and chemist gives you an antibiotic or prescription. That is the old story in India. That's why there is a rampant uh, antibiotic resistance. There are patients who just die off because the chest infection cannot be cleared. And trust me, that number is getting larger and larger and larger because even vancomycin doesn't work on them. So yes, to answer to your question is yes. And the once COVID goes away and it will go away, it will become endemic and finally it will disappear. The biggest problem this country or these all over the world will face will be antibiotic resistance both gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria, especially gram-negative bacteria. They kill very large number of old people. Yeah, and the more we find out about antimicrobial resistance, the more scary it is. Recently, a research came out uh, which showed that, in fact, antimicrobial resistance evolved before we started using antibiotics in nature. And now it is it also spreads between species when the bacteria do. So it's, it's actually quite a scary thought. Like you oh, they are very efficient. They are very efficient by using different mechanism, each different from the other, getting over. So therefore, usage of this has to be very careful, very right. very careful. Right. As it right. is in your, as it is in developed country, you can't access a, a second, third generation antibody in England at all unless you have a prescription. Yeah. And that's a, yeah. That's a, that's a discussion for another day. That's Definitely. Something. Indeed. And in fact, I would have loved to bombard you both with more questions, but unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time right now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ganguly and Dr. Chauhan for answering our questions. And we hope this was really helpful to the viewers as well. And also really hope that uh, indiscriminate usage of medicines that are not needed starts to come down now, especially during and after the third wave. Thank you also to Abantika for joining us and please do join us for our next session.